And, and you know, um, I'd like everybody, hi Marina. I'd like everybody to do an exercise like this on Christmas day, you know, and see how they like it, you know. It's quite, a, quite an experience, okay. Now this, this is one of the most important visions in the, in the Red Book too. And it's the last one of Salome and Elijah, and then we get to see the red one, you know, and we'll get to talk about who is the devil, you know. And of course, the devil, the red one, actually kind of looks like Young, and then Young wears this green suit that at the end turn, starts sprouting leaves, you know. So that's what we'll talk about next time. All right, so this is December 25th, 1913, okay? And uh, it says, uh, um, Young says, do I wish for this, even desire it? I don't know. Everything is extremely dark and thoroughly mysterious. This secret is kept virginally. And then he stops himself. But what am I talking about? This secret is better kept than any man could keep it because no man could touch it unless it had been given to him. In other words, this is, um, there's this uh, saying of Zosimos where uh, this knowledge can't, uh, does not come from teaching. You know, it has to uh, come from, uh, it has to be given to us. You know, and so this is this is going to be a very interesting. Th this is uh, the the idea that the ego needs to become an empty vessel for the images from the other world, which are not accessible to ego consciousness, and they're always surprising, and they're always uh, um, if they aren't surprising, and if they are explainable, then you know, that's not uh, uh, really what is transformational. Something that's very alien, very other. Okay, so it's a secret kept better than any man could keep it because no human hand could touch it unless it had been given to him. And no one can steal it and no one can rob it violently. The gate only opens to he who waits for and unknowingly. And uh, this comes up uh, too when Young is being accused of being impetuous and coming, uh, he, he only sees who comes without desire. So um, anyway, now this is, this is a very important uh, uh, entry. Young is standing before a ridge leading up to a wasteland. Uh, a, uh, it is a, um, it's, it sort of represents, I think, the rock on which the house of the Temple of Wisdom is built. There's just this aspect of it that it's devoid of all features. You know, it's the, it's the prima materia, you know. And uh, uh, there's gray jagged stones and a blue sky. And uh, we catch a sight of the prophet from above me. And his hand makes an averting movement. Don't, don't uh, come up. And he abandons his decision to climb up. Hi, Jordy. And uh, he waits below, gazing upward, because something's going to happen. And that's the object of, of the prophet being uh, above. And the prophet's coat flutters in the wind. And he, uh, Young looks to the left, and it is dark night. And he looks to the to the right, or he looks, or he looks to the right, and it is dark night. And he looks to the left, and it's bright day. Now this is young. Young is uh, is separated from the day and the night, and this union of the day and the night is the object of the vision. Okay. Uh, the, there's a rock that separates day and night. And the night is like a hugely monstrous, uh, uh, like a monstrously huge but transparent monster 
like a serpent or a dragon. And uh, I just wanted to, uh, Young, Young had a poet that he really liked. I think uh, his name was Charles Pigou. And uh, this is, uh, uh, was uh, one of his comments that Young quoted. O oh, night, you are the night. And all, those, all the days together are never the day. They are never anything but days sown. Those days are never anything but lights and uncertain lights. And you, night, are my great dark light. Days are islets and isles. They pierce and rend the sea, but they have to rest in the deep sea. They have to rest in the night. They are compelled to do so, resting in the deep night, for you are the deep sea. So the night somewhat represents the, uh, uh, and, 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 and Pigou says it uh, literally um, here. Um, this is, um, oh, my daughter, night, you're the most religious of my daughters. You're the most pious. Of all my uh, daughters, of all my creatures, you are the one who is most in my hands, the one who most completely yields. You glorify me more in sleep than your brother day glorifies me in work. You know, and uh, this, this is um, actually the, almost the very same thing is, is said by um, Wolfram von Eschenbach at the start of Parsifal, where he says, all the world is black and white. You know, that if you're active, if you're like Brother Day and you work, you, you move towards the light, but you can ever get rid of the, the dark of the night, which is, um, you know, the one who is most receptive to the psyche of the depths because it's um it it is it it really is the the um represents in young and we're going to find this out it's going to represent in young the the aspect of him that is unconscious and needs to be brought to the light the the night longs to be known and it's known by ego, and the ego is the light. So anyway, it's just, uh, this, is, this is what this serpent battle sort of represents. The rock separates day and night. The night is like a monstrously huge black but transparent serpent or dragon. The day, in contrast, contains a massive white serpent with a golden crown, okay, the crown of ego. You know, the king, the one that thinks it's the king. And uh, both serpents thrust their heads towards, e towards each other, eager for battle. So anyway, these are the opposites, you know, who uh, can't tolerate each other. And yet w they require each other. There's no, there's no, uh, not, one can never gain ascendancy. You know, Elijah stands on the heights between them. And the prophet raises his hands in prayer as if, um, you know, let, let this um, battle begin. And this battle is happening in Young, okay? And this is going to lead in to the next event. So suddenly the serpents throw themselves from the ridge and a terrible wrestling ensues. The serpent of the night is to a larger extent on the side of the day. It's moved into consciousness. Okay, uh, the center of gravity uh, is shifting. Enormous billows of dust rise from the struggle and blur sight. The serpent of the night pulls itself back. The front part of its body has become white. Okay, well, where have we seen that before? You know, uh, the... Uh, The, the front part of its body has become white. Look at the lower uh, part of the Taoist symbol, you know? And uh, the, somebody was showing that the Taoist symbol comes from a, 
from the uh, uh, actually comes from an, uh, the uh, equinoxes, you know, the, the how the equinoxes work on the Earth, on the on the globe of the Earth has pretty much the same shape. You know, if you look at wind on uh, on this flattened out globe with all the latitudes and longitudes, if you plot them out, they look somewhat like the Taoist symbol, you know, where the uh, tail of the dark side um, penetrates the white and the tail of the white side penetrates the darkness, you know, so, um, and then each contains a little bit of the other. So this, this is how the opposites are reconciled. Morning, Adam. Just getting started here. You haven't missed too much um, yet. And uh, we're gonna might end a little early so that um, we can share and then Gary might uh, has an exercise unless you do. So now the serpents uh, curl about themselves, one in the light and the other in the darkness. And Elijah climbs down from above and possesses positions himself standing at some distance. So this is all for Young's benefit. And he says to Young, what did you see? And he says, I saw the fight of two formidable serpents, a white and a black one. It seemed to me as if the black would overcome the white serpent, but behold, the black one withdrew and its head and the top part turned white. Okay, so anyway, I mean, this what this means, or, or let's go a little bit further. Um, Elijah says, did you understand that? And he says, I have thought it over, but I cannot come to a clear explanation. Should it perhaps mean the power of the good light will become so great that even the night that resists it will be um, illumined by it? And that's not the answer. Yeah, and Elijah says, follow me. I mean, what the answer might be, you know, is that, um, you know, um, it, it's like um, the uh, Captain Ahab and Moby Dick or, um, you know, the King David and Goliath. You know, we, we need the, the uh, if you're not in this dialogue with the depths, the dark side can't uh, gain ascendancy, even though it's the mother, even though it is the source. It needs to, uh, the, the white side or ego light needs to keep its position on the earth so that it can be the assimilator of this. It can't be in flooded or inundated by the depths. It needs to maintain its position. You know, now this is the, this is a wonderful uh, image for Young, the, um, that he's not to be swallowed up by the depths. In the struggle between day and night, between the black and the white serpent, both need to assimilate the other because they can't live without each other. But anyway, so uh, Elijah says, um, uh, follow me. And he climbs along to the ridge into the heights and he follows and uh, young follows and they come to a very uh, high summit. And on top, we find some cyclopean masonry. Now, do you know what cyclopean means? It means, it means that you just go, you don't form the rocks. You just go find the rocks and you make a wall. It's like um, Hadrian's wall or something, you know, you just, take rocks and you fit them together they're unformed rocks and you make and some people make buildings out of these like this i mean you could see the romans were really good at making what they called cyclopean walls you know and uh uh anyway it's uh if you ever just google it you know they're very beautiful um because some people are so good at this okay um so um with, with dark cracks and holes, and all cyclopean walls have dark cracks and holes. They don't, you know, they usually don't even put any mortar in them. You know, they, they're just uh, um, fit together very uh, expertly. And it, it appears to be like a court 
yard or a circular rampart. And uh, so he's thinking later it's a, it might be a, a, a place of worship or some kind of a sacred temple. And beneath the bulwarks are cavernous rooms. And in the middle of the car courtyard, a mighty rock, an enormous boulder flat on top. The prophet stands on top of the stone and he says, this is the temple of the sun. The encircled place is a vessel that collects the light of the sun. Okay. So what is, uh, this is the temple of the sun. This is, it collects the light. Um, and, uh, you know, we're supposed to be, uh, Young says later about this um, symbol, and, uh, you know, he's almost directly quoting uh, Elijah here, is, uh, you know, you must make yourself uh, into a vessel of creation in which the opposites reconcile. So this is the place of creation in which the opposites reconcile that we're talking about right here. And this, these are, now, now again, um, when we get any image, I mean, the idea of the ego cooperating in, as an equal partner with the depths is that we're, we are to take the images that were sent and we're to become two things, both the medium of expression and uh, the, um, the one who gives words and meanings to, the med to what we've expressed it as a medium of expression. And you know, it, it kind of is similar to the two ravens that accompanied Wotan you know, one was named thought and the other one was named memory. You know, the memory is just this medium of expression side and the thought is meaning, you know, and those were the two ravens that brought Wotan, this, the messages from all over the world, you know, and so that he could have the knowledge from all over the world. Um, I was hearing about a, uh, there was an Australian young in who, uh, who um, said that he, he, he went into analysis because this raven landed on his lap every time he went outside and it, would, and it wouldn't go away until he started analysis. So, and then after he started analysis, the raven didn't land on his lap anymore. You know? So uh, anyway, it was, uh, so this, this encircled place is the vessel that collects the light of the sun. And as Elijah climbed down from the stone, I realized that his form had become smaller. He'd become a dwarf who seems foreign to me. There's a purpose for this. You know, I look astonished and I said, who are you? And he says, I am Meme, M-I-M-E, and I will show you uh, the wellsprings, okay? Well, Meme is a famous character in, uh, 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 in the uh, Wagner's Siegfried, you know, and there's Meme. He's the one that, that um, he, cr he crafted a sword so that Siegfried could kill the monster um, Fafnir who had uh, the ring that was made from the Rheingold. And uh, uh, that whoever wore it would possess all power. And uh, after uh, Meme created the uh, sword, that the invincible sword that Siegfried was to use to kill Fafnir, and, and he kills Fafnir, but then Siegfried kills Meme because Meme was going to kill Siegfried uh, after he had killed Fafnir. And which is interesting because now two murderers of uh, Siegfried are joined together here, Meme and and uh, and Young, because Young murdered Siegfried too. You know, so anyway, uh, I am Meme, and I will show you. What is he going to show you? The well springs. Okay. Now we've heard a lot about the well springs, 
that Elijah has from Salome. Okay, uh, and uh, the, the light that has been collected by the vessel, and this is the temple of the sun. The light, and this is really, I think, is, is the, the temple of the sun represents the informing wisdom of the depths, you know. And they pour into the temple of the sun, into consciousness. They don't come from the sun, but I mean, the, it's the meaning that comes into consciousness. And that then it turns into water uh, that goes into the, to, uh, the well springs, you know, so that the, the water of life is filled with um, this wonderful water that comes from the temple of the sun. The temple of the sun would probably represent the self, you know, this uh, center uh, ordering archetype, the one that orders all archetypes, you know, that gives form to, uh, to everything, you know. So, uh, you know, the created life, you know, uh, that, uh, you, you know, is absolutely, it's, it's what is, is, is a, um, what's called neg entropy, you know, it's something that occurs despite all, uh, opposed to all the laws of thermodynamics. There is no way you can explain how life has come into being with any physical uh, uh, laws of physics because it defies all those laws. So why is it here? You know, it's this, um, it's this, uh, implausible order okay and uh, that's what we are we are in a very implausible order an order that can't be explained and yet we kind of take it for granted you know so uh, he says i am meme and i will show you the the well springs the light that has been collected by the vessel becomes water and flows into many springs from the summit into the valleys of the earth. And Meme goes to one of the crevices in the masonry and dives down into the dark, and Young follows him. Inside it is black night. And one can hear the rippling of the waters, and the voice of the dwarf sounds from below. Here are my wells, and whoever drinks from them becomes wise. Okay. Uh, this is uh, um, the, the uh, I think when Meme calls them my wells, you know, he's sort of like a Kabiri, you know, he's the, um, he is the um, sort of the, the um, daimon of the, of the depths, and he's sort of the guardian of these wells. And, uh, but now Young cannot reach down and instead, he clings onto a stone above. He's not ready to drink from these wells. And slowly, his eyes got, uh, get conditioned to the dark, and he sees the dwarf standing in the bluish dim light besides a small water rivulet. But he can't reach down. Now, you, you might have experienced this in dreams, too, that you know, I always try to get something to look into my eyes. It won't look, you know, or... You know, my wife had this dream where, where this dying person uh, who needs her help, she sees him, but she can't get to him. You know, I mean, and uh, it's just the fact that, the, that we can see the treasure hard to attain, but we're not ready for it, you know. So um, anyway, the door, the, uh, it, it, he uh, loses courage, Young loses courage. And outside in the giant car courtyard, he sees the bright sun pouring. And now he's sort of, uh, that's all, this is the end of the vision. The dwarf seems ghostly to me. I have the feeling of hallucination. And doubting, I pace back and forth in the giant squares of the yard. So he's seen the wellsprings from which, which all wisdom comes, you know. And the wisdom comes from, uh, from the, the light of the self that pours into the uh, great circle and then seeps down into the depths from uh, this kind of implausible 
order and plausible meaning. You know? And uh, uh, he's, he's undecided um, whether a phantom has lured me to this place or not, because everything appears so strange and incomprehensible. Who was this? Was it Elijah or was it me? And it's so solitary and so deathly silent here. And yet it has a clear, cool air as on the remotest mountains and a wonderful flood of sunlight all around. So, um, you, you know, the light of ego consciousness, even though it is, uh, is clear and cool and a wonderful flood of sunlight all around, doesn't answer a lot of questions. You know, I mean, it's just, I mean, be, being able to see doesn't mean that we are able to understand, you know, because it's uh, incomprehensible, he says, even though there's a great light, clear light. And I see around me the uh, mighty walls that form the horizon, jagged crenellations. It's interesting. A crenellation is, is a castle with um, places cut out so that you can hide behind here and then you can go in there and shoot your arrow and then come back in. And so that's what they call a crenellation. You know, it's, it's a place where you can uh, move from protecting to uh, move, move from a passive protective position to an active uh, position. And uh, there's gray and yellow lichens grow on the stones. Uh, 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 apart from this, there's not a blade of grass. You know, I've seen this um, in the great um, plateaus in Norway. Um, there's one called Sundalsora, and you just feel like you're on the moon, and there's all these gray and yellow lichens. And uh, Marina, you might have seen those in the Highlands, you know, or, or someplace in Scotland. And, and uh, anyway, it is, uh, they, they told me some of those are thousands of years old, some of those lichens, you know, because it takes them so long to grow, you know. And uh, anyway, it's, it's just interesting. And it says, uh, and then Young says, this is, I said, what is it with this place? That's <laughs> So direct quote, well, what is it with this place? I think it could be a druidic, a sacred druidic place of worship. And then a black serpent crawls across the stone. It's the serpent of the prophet. How did it get here from the underworld? You know, and my gaze follows it. And I see how it crawls on the wall. Now, we, we should be getting a little bit acquainted with the nature of the serpent, all these serpents. The serpent really represents the undifferentiated psyche, you know. And so like when uh, Marina last week, you saw like an alligator or something like that. It's, uh, it really represents a, uh, what you'd see in an alchemical emblem, you know. First, we must kill the undifferentiated psyche. Then it will, there, it will follow a rebirth into something that is more ego-like, for instance, a stag, you know, and it's sort of a progression uh, through ethereomorphic forms, animal forms, until it becomes um, more, it, it can become more human. But the psyche has great difficulty coming up from the depths into our ego consciousness. You know, it is, um, it it's, takes a great effort and it's, uh, its its form is really dictated by our own ability to uh, speak to the depths and uh, uh, not just our ability, but the experience. I mean, we have to abs actually do it over and over again before um, this uh, uh, this undifferentiated aspect can can become more uh, something we can communicate with. But it, it, it's a very good symbol because it's, it's so riveting, fascinating. And Jung says uh, it, it, it always slithers away when we see it. But if we follow it, it will lead us where we need to go. So and anyway, it is, uh, crawls along the stone. and It's the serpent of the prophet. His gaze follows it. And I see how it crawls along the wall. I feel weird all over. A little house stands there with a portico, minuscule, 
struggling up against the rock. The serpents become infinitely small. What really be happens is the walls become infinitely big, you know, and uh, the, the serpents, um, I feel as if I'm, I am shrinking and the walls enlarge into a huge mountain and I am uh, below on the foundation of the crater in the underworld. And I stand before the house of the prophet, which, which seems to have returned to its natural size. And uh, he, here below, it is dark and nocturnal as always. And the prophet appears in the doorway of the house. So, well, Young's going to say, Young's going to say what I just said, what it's going to say. That, uh, I enter in with a quick step and speak to Elijah. I notice that you have shown me and let me experience all sorts of strange things before you allowed me to come here to see you today. But I confess that it is all dark to me. Your world appears to me today in a new light. Okay. The, I think, you know, he's not understanding the serpent battle. But again, the battle is between Jung's um, thinking function and uh, it, 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 it's really the sublimation of, the, of his dominant function. And it needs to be crushed before, before new things can, spring, can sprout. You know, it's, it's just too annihilating. You know, um, uh, it just, uh, just now it was if, if, if we were separated by a starry distance from your place, which I still had uh, hoped to reach today, but behold, it seems to be one in the same place. You, you are my, you are my son. Uh, oh, you, my son, wanted to come here too much. Okay, you know I do this often too. And some, if I want to go to go to this place I was yesterday, the river, it's never there. You know, or I want to see a person I see saw yesterday, they're not there. You know, there I can. And, and how do I know this? I don't know, but I just don't feel them. I don't feel it, you know. And uh, I, I did not deceive you. You deceived yourself. He sees badly who wants to see. He measures too much. You have overreached yourself. He sees badly who wants to see. He measures too much. So... Um, that's that's and uh, the the aspect of this um, this work is that the depths need to be allowed to speak, you know, and they're not going to be able to speak if we come down there with directed thinking, you know. We have to um, we have to become an empty vessel. Other for when the vacuum occurs in the empty vessel, then these other um, sort of very vaporous forms gradually can enter, but not until the, there's a vacuum there. And if we come there with all kinds of direct thinking, nothing can come in because there's too much pressure uh, in the in the vessel, and they, this um, other substance cannot come in. It is true. I not only wished to, but I eagerly longed to uh, reach you to hear what you and Salome would continue to explain to me. Salome startled me and, and uh, led me in bewilderment. I felt dizzy because what she said to me seemed monstrous and like madness. And where is Salome, by the way? Have you ever been infatuated with a girl and go over to where she is? Where is Salome? You know, you're looking around. How impetuous you are today. What is it with you? Uh, step first over to the crystal and probe your heart in its light. Okay, before you can speak to us, you know, probe your heart in its light. See who, see, um, you know, throw an I Ching hexagram or something. Probe your heart in its light. Yeah, this, is, this is requirement before you can interact with us. That's what I think the purpose of the crystal is. 
there that before uh, you can speak, you need to probe your own heart. And uh, so he walks to the crystal and there's a wreath of fire appears in front of my eyes and it encircles a void. And I'm seized with fear. As soon as he walks to the crystal, he sees the wreath of fire. And then my father, I see a boot like the one, the Bund shoe has in its coat of arms. The Bund shoe is a, uh, was the, uh, I don't know if you've ever, uh, heard of the peasant war, you know, but it's the, uh, um, you know, uh, this is, this is the, sh the flag of the Bund shoe and it's a peasant boot. Uh, and the, uh, the, the rope means that it ties everyone together. It's a tied up shoe, but the, but the, the shoe strings are so long that they, um, that, that anyone can use them. I mean, that's what kind of the symbol was, you know, there's, uh, you know, the, the bun shoe, uh, they were just tired of, uh, like anyone was. And this was the, the ruler of the peasant war. His name was Job uh, Fritz, you know, and uh, he was, of course, uh, they, um, these, these uh, wars were easily put down. I mean, one time uh, was uh, like a army of three to 400 uh, mounted knights uh, subdued a 5,000 man um, army of the, of the peasants because they just didn't, you, you know, they just weren't uh, professional soldiers. And then he sees the foot of a giant that crushes an entire city. Okay, now this could be one of two things. It could be, um, you, you know, when you hear about it, you sometimes think it has something to do with World War I, but I think it, it really has something to do with, um, with Young's, uh, um, his own life, that that needs to be snuffed out, whatever it is, this, um, this great um, edifice that he built needs, to, I don't know, I mean, that's, I'm just guessing. It's a little bit of a stretch. And then I see the face of the sun, and it's me, face of the sun. So it's his inner self, really. I mean, when, when we talk about the self too, I think just like the anima and the shadow, it, it's our self that we were born with, just like we're born with the anima. There's a self, an ordering archetype in us that expresses our inner law. And my inner law is not the same as your inner law. So. When my self speaks to me, it doesn't speak, it speaks to me in my own inner law, not your inner law, you know? And so it's going to be different for me than it is for you. So the son smiles with Young's face and he says, what does it mean? And he says, look for, uh, Elijah says, look further, you are impetuous. That means you're too quick and you're too careless. Temper your desire. You, you see, you stand in your own way. You're the one that's, that is standing in the way of, of understanding. And he says, I see the cross, and I see the removal of the cross, and I see the mourning and how agonizing this sight is. No longer do I yearn. He says, you must and he says, I see the child uh, with the white serpent in his right hand and the black serpent in his left hand. And that's, that's just an interesting image. I mean, it's, uh, is it something that, I mean, if you do, I, I just kind of tried to find a image, but it's sort of a, when you see a child with a snake, it's a little bit startling, you know but it has a black one in its left hand. And a, now what does that mean? It means the growing thing is informed by a, uh, by a, a knowledge that is not, does not have grammar in it. You know, uh, it's, a, it's a black and white serpent, you know, the serpent with uh, black and white, you know, and, uh, 
that the, the psyche um, is doesn't speak in in a language you know it speaks in images like um, this was his uh, his uh, criticism your Christ is all light and no darkness why the self manifests in two colors white and black he cannot be identified with the whole self Christ can only with its light side you know so there's this aspect of uh, Tim's here. Just a second. Sorry. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, that uh, he sees the child with this, the white serpent in his right hand and the black serpent in his left hand. Okay. And uh, hi, Tim. We're going to, um, we haven't got through too much. We're, we haven't got to the really good part yet, anyway. After what we went through, we're not to the good part yet. It says, I see the green mountain and the uh, cross on it and the streams, uh, uh, streams and streams of blood uh, are flowing from the summit of the mountain. I can no longer look, it is unbearable, you must. And I see the cross and Christ on it in his last hour and his last torment. And at the foot of the cross, the black serpent has coiled itself. The psyche. Now, you, you know, it's a very, it's a great mystery what the crucifixion means because it's it's kind of alien to us. But I think what it really is saying is that the ego must be sacrificed at the center of a quaternity on which it's suspended, and uh, so that the uh, so that the Christ can come forth, so that the so that the um, uh, the second man who's born of heaven can come forth. You know, the the ma the the first man is from the earth and of the earth, and the second man is of the psyche and from the psyche. And then, and the only way that the second man can come forth is for the ego to be sacrificed at the center of quaternity and. The idea of the uh, blood flowing and things is going to come up in this next image, but it's a very mysterious sign. Is that the um, that the uh, uh, there there's some object of uh, young? You're going to find later that um, a lot of the figures that Young speaks to can't speak unless he lends them his blood. Okay. So in other words, to let the, the psyche speak, we need to uh, give them our life essence, you know, which is represented by blood. You know? So I think that, that's, that's part of the less gory reason for there to be blood, is that blood allows the depths to speak and they can't, can't speak without. Um, uh, this, this is why, uh, while we're alive, you know, um, that we need to be, have both our feet on the ground, you know, and we not, we don't want to be too eager to, to, to let our feet, uh, because otherwise we don't learn anything, you know, I mean, we have to maintain our human stance because the, the whole idea here is that, um, Young says that all of history is a uh, is the progressive incarnation of a deity into a living, blood flowing organism who has both feet on the earth. You know, so um, I think that, that there's a mystery here. You know, and we don't really understand it, but but maybe it can't be put into words. You know. Um, so uh, then the black serpent has coiled itself. Craig, can you say that again? The all of history is a progression of what? Oh, okay. Well, Young says, uh, and we can look it up too to get the exact words, but uh, the entire history of culture is, uh, is the story of the progressive incarnation in a living organism. That's the human, the homo mythicus whose feet are on the ground, the 
progressive incarnation of a deity into a living organism. You know, in other words, that's the whole ont ontological purpose for what's happening here is that in this form, in you sitting here, there needs to be a, uh, uh, the, um, you need to have uh, become the empty vessel for this deity, you know, and allow it to use you to become conscious. Okay, so the ego consciousness can't become inflated here because it's not its purpose. The what what is the what is is to be created is not anything in ego awareness. It is to be the symbol of meaning, this third thing, which totally transforms the God archetype or evolves it, you know, into what uh, maybe at some point Pierre Tillard de Chardin calls the noosphere, where all minds will be one, you know, all creatures will share the same mind at the same time. You know, I mean, that's was his vision for what um, possibly the age of, um, you know, we're moving into the age of the water bear from the age of, of the, the fish. The water bear carries the psyche within it. The, the one that follows is, um, is of the goat fish. You know, uh, is that, um, is that Capricorn or I don't know, but it, yeah. It's the one where it's half fish, half the depths, and half the uh, uh, the summit. So it's it it is the being of the summit and the being of the depths to become one. You know, so uh, what that means, nobody knows. You know, we can just guess. But anyway, the progressive incarnation of a deity is the the idea here. You know, um, uh, so. Um, Anyway, at the foot of the cross, the black serpent has coiled itself. We're almost done here. And uh, then I thought, oh, we've got to get it almost done. I feel that the serpent of the prophet has wound itself around my feet and ties itself too tightly. The prophet looks at me with fiery gaze. I am contained, and I spread my arms wide as if spellbound. Okay. Well, um, and then Salome draws near. From the right, the serpent has wound itself around my whole body, and it seems to me as if my countenance is that of a lion. And Salome says, Mary was the mother of Christ. Do you understand? You know, and uh, let me just show you uh, this uh, image here. Uh, this is uh, right here. This is what Young's talking about, you know, except that his arms are stretched wide as if he's the Christ. But this is um, uh, variously called ion, sometimes associated with phonies, sometimes associated with abraxas, you know, but it's this Gnostic deity. And she says, Mary was the mother of Christ. Do you understand now? You know, uh, it's very. That's a very interesting question because uh, uh, that's that I got that question one time from what was purported to be young. You know, I had this image of the uh, Christ and uh, Astarte. You know, and uh, the question was, "Do you understand?" You know, I mean, it was uh, stream. Was um, let me say uh, it says uh, that there was four ordered pairs, and one pair was the crucified Christ and the lost star Astarte. Astarte, and Young says, "Do you understand the relationship between the crucified Christ and Astarte?" And then there were other three other pairs of animals: one sheep, the other two more uncertainly burrows and camels. And I ask uh, 
Young if the lost star represented Jerusalem? And he said, no, this happened in 136 AD, and, uh, which is an interesting number. I don't know what it meant. But um, anyway, uh, dur dur and, and, but we, we, the, the Young's, Young's knowledge was a little, um, was seemed extensive, but he was distracted because Pope Den Benedict was going to be at the potluck lunch. So we went to lunch, and uh, then the young started talking about Boudicca, you know, the female uh, war leader in Britain who fought the Romans. Uh, and he overheard him speaking of that there are two Boudiccas, Boudicca one, or Boudicca, and then I Boudicca, you know, the Boudicca in me. There was an outer Boudicca and an inner Boudicca. You know, and uh, anyway, that's just interesting. Do you understand? You're going to hear that question many times. I mean, it, that they just keep saying, do you understand? You know, and uh, I think he's going to say something. Well, late, earlier he says that you stand in your own way. You know, you're the one that is clouding this whole process. You know, and uh, so uh, Mary was the mother of Christ. Do you understand now? I see that uh, terrible and incomprehensible power forces me to imitate uh, the Christ in his final moment. But how can I presume to call Mary my mother? You know, and then Salome says, you are the Christ. Okay. In other words, you have become the second man. Okay. Now, this is very interesting. It's not something to be inflated about because what is going to happen after this has happened? After he has experienced that there is an aspect of all of us in which the second man can appear within us. And that's really the object of all what we're doing here is to have this second man uh, 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 become conscious within us. And, um, I stood with outstretched arms like someone crucified, my body taut and horribly entwined by the serpent. And Elijah looks at me with blazing eyes. You, Salome, say that I am the Christ. And then it's as if I stood alone on a high mountain with stiff outstretched arms. The serpent squeezes my body in, body in terrible coils and the blood streams from my body, spilling down the mountainside. But now I'm back in front of the crystal still in this same position. So the, it's shifted. And Salome bends down to my feet and wraps her black hair around him. So she's wrapping um, her intellect, you know, or her upper functions around uh, Young's feet. So this is a very interesting. She wraps the upper against his lower, you know. I think somebody had a dream that was like this. And then she lies there for a long time and then she cries, I see the light. She's regained her sight. And truly she sees, her eyes are open. And the serpent falls from my body and lies languidly on the ground. I stride over it and kneel at the feet of the prophet whose face shone like a flame. And he speaks, your work is fulfilled here. Other things will come of which you do not know yet but seek untire, untiringly. Now this is, this is, is one of the most important statements you'll find in the whole red book. Seek untiringly and above all, write exactly what you see. That's one of the most important statements I think you'll find in the red book is that you need to write down. In fact, as soon as I read that this morning, I remembered a dream I had and I immediately went down and made sure I recorded it just a, a scene I'd say. And Salome looks on his rapture, uh, at the, the light and the streams forth from the prophet. Elijah transforms into a huge flame of white light and the serpent lies down at the feet of the flame. Salome kneels before the light in wonderstruck devotion. Tears fall from my eyes. Now this is not uh, figuratively. Tears flowed from Young's eyes. I don't know if you guys, I have had visions of where I was so grateful that uh, I teared up. My feet do not touch the ground, this alien earth, 
and as if I am melting back into air, melting into air, and now he's back in his office. Uh, some, uh, something has been completed, as if I'd been brought here. Uh, uh, something has been brought to me with a certainty and a hope. And remember, Young said last time that hope comes from the same place these images come from. Hope and longing, I think. And uh, what, what I think that we can sum it up as is that the reason uh, Salome or Eros in Young was blind was because um, she was subjugated by Elijah, by Logos. And she could not be subjugated by Logos. Eros cannot be uh, subservient to Logos. And so this ritual of Young uh, being crucified, surrounded by the, uh, by the uh, serpent and uh, uh, experiencing this, uh, that, this uh, second man coming forth, it has broken the spell of Jung's ego consciousness dominating his eros. In other words, the tension has been released. Eros is now able to operate freely again. So now Salome can uh, see. So anyway, I'm going to end it here. And um, uh, I would really like, uh, now Gary has a exercise. Gary, do you think it, uh, do you want it for it to be the last 20 minutes or so we can have a little bit of discussion here? Yeah, that's fine. And, and also uh, I wanted to check with Adam first to see if he had an exercise. If Adam has an exercise, we'll do his. Okay, sure. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, great. Well, I'm going to uh, turn off YouTube here for a second. And let's see.